Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to talk about EC-135 rotor brake disc replacement, and we're gonna go over a handful of things, okay? This one is gonna be a long video. Sorry about that, but uh, the maintenance manual isn't super clear. It's not straightforward. There's a couple things that are not in the manual on this procedure for changing the disc. But anyway, first we're gonna go over the parts that we're, we're gonna need that are uh, you have to replace every time and then some optional parts you might want to have on order or have in your stock. We're also going to go through the inspection section of the rotor brake and the rotor brake disc. We're going to go over replacing the disc and that all includes a lot of things, okay? There's a whole bunch of different configurations of this brake disc, but I'm pretty sure our entire fleet now has the newest version. And I think it was after serial number 400 or something like that. There's a service bulletin that has you, if you want to, update it to the um, newest style disc. Pretty sure our entire fleet has a new style disc. Pretty much a once over on this job, what you're gonna do, what we're gonna go over is we're gonna disconnect the front of the front tail rotor drive shaft. We're gonna remove the coupling flange. We're gonna go over how to remove the brake uh, caliper, the simplified version, because their manual isn't super clear. We're gonna reinstall everything. And after you do that, you're gonna have to shim the caliper to the new rotor. After you do that, you're gonna have to replace the uh, rotor brake pucks or linings. And after you get all that together, you're going to have to check the indication system and then you're going to do a run in of the rotor brake pads to the ro new rotor brake disc. And there's a whole bunch more, okay? We're going to go over things that you're going to need to watch out for and we're going to clarify the manual. All right? There's definitely a lot of rabbit holes that we're going to go down and some that we're going to try not to go down that you might have to go down on your own. It's going to be long. This is probably going to be about half an hour. But I recommend watching this video. Like all my videos, I send them out because I want you to learn from the mistakes that I have made in the past. Mistakes that are easy to make because the manual is not very clear. All right, let's go through this. Okay, first thing we're going to go over is parts that you're going to need to replace while you're doing this job and some other parts that are optional. First part, the six nuts that hold the flex coupling onto the adapter flange and the, long sh or the tail rotor drive shaft. That's part number DIN 65480-08 Delta, and you have to replace those every time with new nuts. The other one that you need to replace are the little bit smaller nuts that hold the adapter flange onto the connecting parts of the transmission output. And there's are three of those, and it's part number DIN 65480-06 Delta. The next thing you need to have on hand is two shims. Part number LN 65045-08, and those go between the caliper and the slideway, which is part of the support. Another part that I recommend that you change and you have on hand, but it's optional, is the nut that holds the caliper onto that support or the slideway support piece. So two of those, and the part number is EN 3536-080. You will also need, of course, new brake linings or brake pucks. Um, there's multiple part numbers on here, and the one that we've ordered the most, I have found, is 107.BB01.06. The part I recommend changing when you're doing this job, because it rarely gets changed, is uh, the nut for the bolt that holds the pucks on, that holds the linings on. And that's part number EN3536-050. The maintenance manual doesn't say to replace the nuts that hold on the brake disc to the connecting parts with new nuts. They're a little bit bigger than the other ones. They're good size. Either way, the part number, I would change them. And of course, the disc itself, uh, there's multiple part numbers. The one that I'm changing on this job is L635 Mike 1025210. Now that we got that done, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this job. Where do you find rotor brake? Well, it's under main rotor drive. So it's chapter 63 and it's in 6351 rotor brake system. We're going to go over the inspections. There's two different chapters or two different uh, sections in the inspection. One's 6 1 and one is 6 2. 6 1 is usually the inspection of whatever system you're in, whatever chapter you're in. 6 1 on Airbus is uh, the inspection section. So on this one, 6-2 is inspect the brake disc itself. And 6-1 is inspect the uh, rotor brake system, but it also has the dimensions of the rotor brake disc, the minimum dimensions. 
So if you go look for it and you obviously like, oh, well, I'm going to inspect the rotor brake disc. Oh, well, it doesn't give me the dimensions on the brake disc inspection, chapter 6-2. So anyway, we're going to go through that real fast. I'm going to do a lot of reading out of this manual, but I'm not going to read everything. And I mean, I'm not going to read it all word for word. Like, look, it's hot. Don't go touch the rotor brake disc after they just used it to stop the rotor because it's going to be hot as crap and you're going to get burned, okay? This one's important though, warning. It says risk of damage to the rotor brake system. If you operate the rotor brake system with a defective brake disc, you can cause damage to it. Make sure that the brace, brake disc is in good condition before you operate the rotor brake system. Yeah, look, the, the reason we're doing this job here is because when they applied the rotor brake, it shattered like a freight train and it was no good, okay? So, so anyway, keep that in mind. If yours chatters like this, you're supposed to, what do they say? They don't say disconnect, but they, uh, you pretty much shut down the rotor brake system so they can't use it. Anyway, you can MEL it is what I'm trying to say, if it's that bad. But we'll go through some warnings here. All right, it says uh, figure one only serves to show possible damage to the uh, brake disc. The design of the brake disc varies depending on the part number. There's like three part number brake discs, like this brake disc right here has holes in it, like like that that's not the one we have that's the old style they're just showing pictures showing cracks and um, hot spots and stuff just do a visual inspection of the surface of both sides of the brake disc for cracks hot spots as follows all right this is important too it says if cracks are detected you have to replace the brake disc before the next flight because it's still spinning it's spinning at a whatever 6,000 rpm a million miles an hour i'm not sure but it's wicked crazy fast so if there's a crack, the thing could still fly apart. All right, cool. Now look for hotspots. Uh, it says right here, typical hotspots are localized tempering colors around the bare metal. Colored homogenous color zone. Okay, that's very interesting wording. In addition to local hotspots, it can be uh, possible to feel dents and bulges in the proximity of the outer circumference of the brake disc. Refer to step two. There's a hotspot. See this right here on this disc? That's not dirt. I cleaned the crap out of it after I took it off. Like that's not, that's, that's a hot spot. Like it expanded or whatever. Crazy wicked. Also, you see that ring around the middle there? This thing got wicked crazy hot like I've never even seen. It got so hot, it discolored the entire disc. Of course, it probably got warped too, which is why it shattered like a freight train when it was, when it was operated. And here's a bunch of other hot spots that you could see. It's hard to take a picture of the hotspots because this thing is shiny and it reflects everything. Hotspots, there's like five of them on this side alone. All right, look, if you find hotspots, it just says do not use the rotor brake system until you replace the brake disc, right? Here, here's where it says it says shut down the rotor brake system in accordance with step three, but we're not going to go over that. But look, you could still operate the, um, the, the helicopter, but you just can't use the rotor brake if it's jacked up, like if you found hotspots. Because what'll happen? Well, it'll chatter like a freight train and it'll wreck stuff. It's so number two, examine the outer circumference of the brake disc for dense bulges, faults, and waviness as follows. It's kind of interesting right here anyway. It wants you to clean it with CM2001. What's CM2001? Cleaning agent. RM22, RM55. Never heard of that. Never heard of that. I'm pretty sure they mean something else. More than likely, they meant CM202 because they referenced that multiple times in this entire job for other things. But we're still on the inspection part, okay? And it says mill PRF 680C. I think it's, um, it's a new style PD680. Turn the tail rotor drive shaft and at the same time, this doesn't even make any sense. Anyway, turn the tail rotor drive shaft and have your finger on the outer circumference of the rotating brake disc to feel whether there are dents faults, waviness, and blah, blah, blah. This is like on a 100 hour, 12 month, okay guys? Look for cracks, look for bulges. Those are, you see the bulges? And this is just like if you have hot spots, if you have bulges and dents and stuff like that and warped stuff, you could still operate the helicopter. You just cannot use the rotor brake. Got it? Now we're gonna go over the next section. That was 6-2, that was just inspecting the disc. Section 6-1 is rotor brake system, the entire inspection of the rotor brake system we're not going to go over that but we're just going to point out the fact that they show you the minimum dimensions the minimum thickness of the brake disc and it's uh what do they have here it's five millimeters or 0.197 inches it is replace the disc right 
Okay, great. That was the inspection, but we're doing the job. We're doing replace the disc. So now we're in the maintenance manual, AMM 6351004-4. Removal and install of the rotor brake disc. And there's two effectivities, okay? There's 5 through 442 serial number, and then there's after 442. But look, if you've complied with this one service bulletin and you have the new style disc, it's for the transmission output to the tail rotor. There's a different mount that goes on there all of this all of the transmissions that are getting overhauled they're getting updated i've seen one that had the old style we had to change it out anyway not going down that rabbit hole right now we're just going to go over the replacement of the of the disc which is pretty simple and straightforward but it bounces you to like eight other man manuals eight other manual references but we're going to go over all that effectivity 5 through 442 it shows you the pictures of the old discs Figure one, old disc, super old, never seen that before. Figure two actually shows both the second style and the third style, the newest style. Newest style is on the left, and it shows the mounting flange like we have on figure three. So nothing crazy. But one thing I'm going to talk about more than once is this right here. It says insert locking plate into groove. This locking plate, which is on this picture, which is number nine, it goes between the transmission connecting parts and the adapter flange. And if you didn't know it was there, when you go to take this thing apart, you could drop it, it'll, it'll fall out of there and it'll fall just on the intake tunnel and you won't know it's there, okay? Just a heads up. This piece right here, what's it called? Locking plate number nine. But it doesn't talk about that locking plate in this part. On the removal and installation of the brake disc, for the effectivity serial number 443 and onwards it doesn't talk about it at all that's why i'm that's one of the reasons i'm making this video because the maintenance manual doesn't talk about it but the instructions really aren't complicated look there's four things for the removal of the disc one remove brake caliper two uh put rubber underneath the drive shaft three remove coupling flange and and number four or d remove the disc yeah, that sounds super simple, right? But it bounces you to two different chapters at least. And the installation is even more complicated. All right, so let's get started. Remove brake caliper. We go to the other chapter, which is 4-1. Uh, Remove the brake caliper. We want to make sure we have the right effectivity. Serial number 75 and onwards. That's pretty much everybody. All right, so we scroll down, remove brake caliper, and of course you're gonna have taken off your firewalls and your cowlings and things that you need to get to to get to where you can work on it, right? So I don't have to read those things. But moving on, it says remove attachment hardware, uh, 10, 11, two, and one, and detach a brake caliper from the slideway of the rotor brake mounting. No, you can't do that. That's impossible to do. You cannot do it. Maybe it's possible. It's just super, super difficult, like borderline impossible, okay? Because you can't get to the bolt. So what you got to do instead of that is you just have to take off the support. That's way easy, okay? It's just the two bolts that hold the support in into the transmission. Two bolts with bushing. There's two bolts that hold two bushings in into the transmission, so you just disconnect those. So now we have to go to a different chapter on how to remove and install that brake support, which wasn't on our original trail of maintenance manuals that we're working on. You follow me? It's super simple. It's just you would come to here to get the torques and the procedures. Um, there's, uh, what do they have on it? Mastinox, I think. Anyway, that's on the installation. So this is chapter 63, 5100-4-3. Rotor brake support. Pretty easy. Remove the bolts from the slideway by removing the screws and the bushings. Pretty easy. Then it wants you to remove the rotor brake caliper from the rotor brake support, which we're not going to do right now. Later on, we're going to have to do that when we shim it. So anyway, that's your rotor brake support. You just undo those bolts right there. You pull the bushings out. It's not super easy because they're in there with Mastinox or the new style Mastinox. And then you can just move the whole thing, the caliper and the support assembly, just off to the side. You're going to move it further than that. I just had it set there just for a picture. Okay, great. Now we go back to the original manual part, removing the rotor brake disc. Remove the brake caliper. That part is done now. Next, to prevent damage to the drive shaft of the, of the tail rotor, 
since we're going to disconnect the front of the tail rotor drive shaft, not the entire shaft, it says they want you to put a piece of foam rubber or something underneath it to support it so it doesn't just hang there on the uh, flexible couplings. Anyway, I got some pig blankets and just rolled them up and put them under there. Just like that. Not hard. But since we're here in this area, do you see where I'm pointing right here? This piece of firewall, fixed firewall on the corner that just sticks up? Well, it's super sharp like a razor knife. It's just going to sit there waiting for you to get sliced, trying to slice you at any corner. So watch out for that because I got sliced. Another thing, don't like be aware that that's there so you don't bang into it and bend it to crap and break it. All right, because then you're going to get a crack or something in there and you're going to have some problems. Just heads up. Back to the manual. All right, we're on step three of four of removing the disc. Easy, right? Remove coupling flange of forward tail rotor drive shaft. And it sends you to another chapter, which is tail rotor drive shaft chapter. 6511-004-1. Let's go there. And look, we're not removing the entire tail rotor drive shaft. Okay? We're just disconnecting the front of it. It's not crazy difficult. So on the parts here that tell you to disconnect the aft bolts, we're not going to do that. We're going to disconnect the six bolts that are attached to the flexible coupling. And that attaches the front of the drive shaft and the, they call this the adapter flange, number one. Six bolts, not complicated. You need new nuts when you put those on. Don't lose your washers. Those, right there. Those bolts right there. Disconnect. Then it says remove the flexible coupling from between the adapter and the coupling flange and take off the forward drive shaft. We're not taking off the forward drive shaft. Remove the flexible coupling. Cool. Take off the bolts. All right, in this picture, the coupling or the flexible coupling's gone. Excellent. Excellent. Next. All right, and we're going to remove the coupling flange, which is attached to the transmission. Okay. It's just uh, there's three bolts. Each bolt has two washers and a nut. The two washers are different part number washers. You'll know what they, you'll know they're different when you look at them, okay? So pull off the nut, pull out the three bolts, grab your six washers, and then you can pull out the adapter flange. Not, not hard, okay? But look, when you take that off, like I was talking about before, is this locking plate. Don't drop the locking plate on the ground. Well, be aware that the locking plate is there so that you can go back with it on the install because that also is not in the maintenance manual. All right, now you can pull off the adapter flange. And look, you can drop that locking plate underneath the cover for the hydraulic lines for the tail rotor. If you didn't know it was there, it will drop and fall down there and you wouldn't know it if you weren't paying attention. Okay, that's what I did, just a heads up, a long time ago. Anyway, back to the manual, all right? Now we're back to the original manual, the original. The uh, brake disc removal. Great. We've got the coupling flange disconnected. Now we're going to remove the attachment hardware 765 and detach the brake disc from the connecting parts. That sounds so easy, right? There's six bolts, big bolts, with six washers and six nuts that hold the brake disc on to the connecting parts of the transmission. Well, this one was so damn warped and overheated, it just didn't want to come off. So it took a little bit of persuasion. I had to put a heat gun on it, I had to beat it up, and I had to hit it with some knocker loose, or whatever, or croil. Anyway, it came off. Fuck. All right, done. It's removed. That honestly didn't take super long. If you didn't know about a couple things, it would have taken a little bit longer. Anyway, it's super dirty up here, as you can tell. So since you have all this stuff apart, now is the time that you need to come up here with a spray bottle with some soap, a brush, and clean the crap out of it because this is the intake tunnel. So clean it and then hose it down and then rag it up, like wipe everything dry. Look for cotter pins and all sorts of stuff. Because you're going to find cotter pins, I'm going to tell you, whenever you're up here, clean the crap out of the tunnel. Because behind these two flanges here, you're going to find, you could find the cotter pins and cut safety wire, they get caught up in these little angles here. So clean them and it gets super dirty because nothing but dust and brake dust fly down this tunnel 
And if you got any leaks in your transmission, it's going to come down here. It's just going to st stick to the oil. All this dust is going to stick to the oil, and it's just going to be super grimy. And then, you know, cotter pins and stuff stick, stick to it. So go up there, clean it out. I'm telling you, seven out of ten times, you're going to find cotter pins or safety wire. All right, I beat that dead horse. Back to the manual. Now it's clean. We got all of our parts. Now time to install the brake disc. Let's do this. Clean the brake disc and adapter using dry cleaning solvent CM202. We already went over that. It's, uh, it's mill PRF680C. It doesn't give you a product name. It used to be PD680. I don't know. Use naphtha or mineral spirits, whatever. I don't know. Apply a thin layer of corrosion preventative paste CM518 onto contact surfaces of connecting parts 3 and brake disc. That's the connecting parts. That's the flange of the transmission and the brake disc. A light, dude, a light, thin layer, okay? Light, thin layer. CM518, what is that? That's the old Massinox. It's actually, this is the replacement for Massinox. Anti-corrosion agent. The product is CA1010-1160. And it's mil PRF8116. So, I know some guys use Corban 27 or the Massinox replacement on other aircraft. For this one, it calls out CA-1010-1160. Done. Position brake disc on connecting part in such a way that the lettering of the brake disc is facing towards the rear of the helicopter. So if you look at your brake disc, there's a part number on it that's supposed to face aft. Attach the brake disc to connecting parts using screws, washers, and nuts. Insert the screws from the side of the brake disc so the screw head faces aft. Insert the screw, which is a bolt, insert the bolt from this side of the brake disc. Torque tighten the nuts 319 to 354 inch pounds, which is a decent amount of torque. Then it says apply a Apply a torsion slippage mark onto the nuts using safety lacquer CM680. Okay, we're going to do the safety lacquer last. The torque stripe, we're going to do all that last. CM680, it's the blue torque stripe. Look, so if, when you're going to torque these nuts, you're going to need a torque adapter or a dog bone or whatever you want to call it to get on the nuts because it's a pretty, um, it's pretty tight fit in there. You don't have much space. And when you're torquing it, also be aware of the other nuts or the other bolts like make sure that your torque wrench isn't up against the other bolts on the front side of that piece because then you're not going to torque it right okay just a heads up or you'll break stuff excellent that's done ensure that after the brake disc has been installed no corrosion preventative paste contaminates the brake disc if next necessary clean the brake disc yeah you might as well just do that now and you're gonna have to do that more than once so you wanted a thin layer on that connecting part of new style Massinox. If you put it real thick, well, when you torque it up, it's going to squeeze it out and it's going to get all over everything. And then your rotor brake disc won't work. Okay, clean it good. Clean off all the extra new, mass, new style Massinox stuff. CA1010. All right, next. Install coupling flange of forward tail rotor drive shaft according to this chapter here. All right, let's go there. Like this is installing the entire front drive shaft. We're just doing the front part of the drive shaft. It's not really hard, right? It's just reverse what we did. If removed, attach coupling flange, which we had removed, to connecting part of the main transmission. It says apply a coat of corrosion preventive paste CM518 to the shanks, not the threads, of the bolts. And those are the bolts holding it onto the connecting part. Okay? There's... Th uh, there's three bolts, they're thinner than the other bolts. Next, apply a thin layer of grease CM101, which is grease Royco 22 CF, Mobile 28, Nyko GN22, Aeroshell 22. Okay, it's just regular grease. It's G395 grease or Mil PRF 81322G. All right, click the link, you'll find out what the stuff is. A thin layer of grease onto the surface of the coupling flange at the flange with the three smaller bore holes. Okay, they want you to put a thin layer of grease onto the part of this flange that attaches to the connecting parts. The part of the flange we're talking about is the one that has three smaller bore holes, smaller holes. Okay, the bigger holes go to the coupling or the flexible coupling. So thin layer of grease. 
just like before. All right, attach coupling flange to connecting parts using bolts, three washers, two and 20, and new nuts, okay? Two and 20 are different washers. Position the coupling flange so that the flange with the three smaller bore holes abuts the connecting parts. Insert the bolts through the coupling flange with their threads pointing towards the connecting parts. Threads are pointing forward. All right, we're gonna take a look at the IPC real quick on the parts. Post tolerance bolt. The washer that goes under the bolt head is number 90, and the washer that goes under the nut is number 80. Anyway, here's a picture of the nut. The nut that's supposed to go over the bolt head is this one right here. And it is an LN 901606L. Not that you need to order one, but that's the one that goes underneath the bolt head. Because that washer has a chamfer. Look on the inside of the washer, the inner circumference of the washer has a chamfer to fit under the bolt head. Because the bolt head isn't flat. The bolt head radius has a little bit of rounding to it. Okay, that's why you put that washer there and the flat washer goes on the other side under the nut. And the other one is an LN9025-0620L. And that one goes under the, the nut. So put them on there. Don't forget this piece. Don't forget the locking plate. Okay, now's the time to put it in there. It doesn't tell you to do that in this manual. The only place it tells you to do this is under the removal and installation of the connecting parts on the tail rotor output drive. This is in chapter 63-2100-411. It tells you to put that in there. But we're not attaching the connecting parts. This isn't part of the connecting parts. I guess it is. It like locks the nut in that holds the connecting part onto the transmission and the torque is only like 120 inch pounds so it's nothing crazy so if you don't have the lock there the thing could come undone and fly apart so if you look down if you're doing the inspection and you look down at the adapter flange where it attaches to the connecting parts if you see that gap that's where that piece is supposed to go and right there that piece is installed Perfect. The locking, or they call it locking, whatever. Don't forget the piece. You beat that horse up pretty good. Next, right here, tighten the bolts to a torque of 53 to 58 inch pounds. You don't torque the nut. It would be impossible to do. You would need crazy adapters to do that. But right here, it tells you tighten the bolts, torque the bolts, not the nuts. So that's super helpful, right? Uh, paint a slippage mark over the heads of the bolts using safety lacquer. I put them over the heads of the nuts because, I don't know, the other nuts are there. Apply a thin coat of CM518 onto the shank, not the threads, of the bolts 7 and 19. Those are the ones that hold on the flexible coupling. Insert the flex coupling between the coupling flange and the adapter of the forward drive shaft. Now they want you to attach the six bolts that hold the flexible coupling on. Okay, the way it works is the nuts are attached to the flexible coupling side with a washer underneath. So the bolt goes through the flange or the drive shaft. So three go one way, three go the other way. So put them in. Don't tighten them until they're all in. And then torque them to 164 to 173 inch pounds and mark them with safety lacquer CM680. And now would be a good time to put that safety lacquer on all the nuts. All right. All right. Now we can go back to the part of the maintenance manual where it talks about removing and installing the disc. So now we just finished installing the coupling flange of the forward drive shaft. Now they want you to remove the foam rubber used to protect the forward drive shaft done. Install brake caliper, um, however, without performing the ground check run yet. This gets a little bit more complicated putting the brake caliper on. So you go back to the section, remove and install brake caliper, make sure your effectivity, we're bouncing all over the maintenance manual, okay? So scroll down to install the brake caliper part. It says remove friction pads and just throw them away because we have a new disc. So you're going to put new pads in there later on. So go down to C down here where it says if the same brake caliper will not be fitted onto the same brake disc, then you have to adjust the brake caliper to the brake disc 
by eight thousandths of an inch eccentricity in the direction of the main transmission. It's complicated. What's it mean? Well, if you look at the drawing, the center line of the caliper and the center line of the brake disc are not lined up. They are off by eight thousandths of an inch. So they want the caliper to be aft of the center line of the brake disc by eight thousandths of an inch. And we're going to walk through this pretty much step by step. So now you unpack your two laminated shims and they want you to cut them both down to one millimeter or thirty nine thousandths of an inch. You can do this check with the, with the uh, shims that are already on there. It would just um, it might throw off your numbers to be a, a minus a negative number, which makes it a positive, which means you have to add shims. If you start this way with a larger pack, a larger shim pack of 39 thousandths, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're only going to have to make it uh, smaller. All right, so we're just going to walk through the example step by step. It's not hard. So if you, if you want to put on the one millimeter shim that they're talking about, then you need to disconnect the caliper from the slideway or the support. It's not hard, it's two bolts, do that. Pull that apart, put the shim pack on there, and then torque it down, and then mount everything back up there, okay? Temporarily fit the caliper using screws, washers, the new shim, the new, or nuts, onto the slideway of the rotor mounting. Okay, good, now it's up there. They want to use a feeler gauge on both sides between the brake disc and the surface projecting inside of the casing of the brake caliper to measure the actual clearance for X and Y and record, record these clearances. That's right here on both sides of the new disc. X and Y. Calculate the, uh, calculate the thickness of the required laminated plate shims, the shims, okay? Calculate eccentricity, Z. So if you read this here, Z equals X plus Y divided by two. That's not a divide sign, that's a colon. If you read that, you'd say, ah, that doesn't make any sense. But if you look at the example, it makes sense. So for this example, we're just gonna go over their example. X, they have 63 thousandths, Y, they have 24 thousandths. Add them together, you get 87 thousandths of an inch. Divide that by two, and that gives you your number for Z, which is the eccentricity. Z, which is the centricity clearance. Interesting. And that gives you 43 thousandths of an inch. Next, calculate the specified clearances A and B. Those are, that's the clearances that it should be. Those are the clearances that X and Y should be, are A and B. Specified clearances A and B. So for specified clearance A, they want you to take Z that you just figured out and add eight thousandths of an inch. Easy. Z, which we just figured out, is 43 thousandths plus eight thousandths. That gives you 51 thousandths. That's what it should be once it's done. Once you're done putting the correct shim in there, you go back, check it again, and A, which is the aft side, which is also X. Well, now we're getting complicated. Anyway, A, which is the aft side, that's what it should measure once you get the correct shim. So now, specify clearance B. What are, how do you figure that out? You take the value for Z, which you just had, which is 43 thousandths, and then you subtract 8 thousandths. So 43 thousandths, subtract 8 thousandths, is 35 thousandths of an inch. Cool. Not crazy complicated, right? All right, now you have A and B and Z, and they want you to calculate the thickness of S, which is the required shim. And if you look at this calculation, it looks kind of crazy. S equals 39 thousandths, which is your current shim, minus the difference between B and Y. Why B? Because B is the side the shim is on, all right? So B, which is the required thickness, of 35 thousandths, you subtract what you actually measured on that area of Y, which was 24. 35 minus 24 equals 11 thousandths. Cool, not done with the calculation yet. You take 39 thousandths, which is your current shim, you subtract 11 thousandths, 
and that gives you the sh what the shim should be underneath the caliper, which is 28 thousandths. Both of your shims should be 28 thousandths in this example. Okay, it's not crazy complicated. Just a little bit of math, right? So you do that. You detach the caliper from the slideway of the rotor brake mounting. So you take the mount off, you disconnect the caliper from the slideway, and you adjust the shim. You peel off laminates of the shim to whatever we just calculated. For my example, I was 37. Anyway, you get your caliper on there, you check it, check it, check it, check it twice, check it three times. Okay, so before you put it all back together, they want you to put a thin coat of 518 onto the fane surfaces of the caliper and onto the th shanks of the screws, the bolts. So fit the caliper back up onto there, torque it down, because if you don't torque it now, you're going to have to take the mount back off to torque the nuts again. Got it? So put the caliper onto the slideway with the new shim, torque the nuts, then put the slideway with the support onto the transmission and go ahead and torque that too. That's a different section. It says prior to tightening the, fi the final torque value, check again the required clearances A and B, and if necessary, align the caliper by adjusting the shim again. So once you got everything up there installed and torqued, check between the disc and the caliper and make sure that it's what it's supposed to be, which is A and B is what you calculated the number should be. A and B are 16 thousandths of a difference. If it's not, you have to take it all off, adjust your shim again, redo your calculation again. All right, cool. Now we have the caliper shimmed correctly to the rotor brake disc. Next, install the friction pads according to this chapter. And we're still on the caliper install. So we're not gonna, we didn't disconnect any lines, so we don't need to bleed, bleed the system. After we put the friction pads in, and if you scroll down, it says perform a functional test on the rotor brake indicating system. You have to do that first before you do the run-in. Even though when you go look at the, the maintenance manual for installing the friction pads, it tells you to do the run-in. You need to make sure your light works before you do a run-in because if your light doesn't work, when you pull the rotor brake down a little bit, expecting the light to come on and it does not, and you keep pulling the rotor brake, tighter and tighter, you're going to burn up those disc, the disc and the pucks and everything. So, note, we're going to come back to this chapter before we do the run-in. No big deal. All right, now we're on the install the friction pads. This is kind of important. Ensure the pins 8 lie within the pin head on the side of the lining against the support plate of the brake lining and are firmly installed in the support plate. Look, there's these rivets on the top of the brake pucks that could get loose. Make sure they're not loose and go ahead and just peen them again. Make sure they're snugged up. Like it's just like a rivet. Uh, all right. Next it says use a wooden wedge and push the brake piston into the caliper. Just like any other brake system you worked on, on, like on a car, right? Whenever the brake linings are replaced, ensure to always replace them in pairs by new ones. Thank you for that. Next, insert the brake linings in the brake caliper so that the linings face the brake disc. Thank you, Captain Obvious, for the double, double Captain Obvious. Yes, put your brake linings so that they're actually touching the brake disc, not backwards, okay? Insert the spring in the brake caliper so that the arrow on the spring central bar points anti-clockwise in the brake disc's direction of rotation. Wow, what does that mean? That sounds like a double negative. It's not, okay? The arrow points in the ro direction of rotation. And then it also says the rounded side of the spring points downward on the brake lining. Yeah, so look, direction of rotation. If you're looking forward, the brake disc is anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. And that's the same way your arrow should point. See the arrow right there? Once it's installed, the arrow is pointing in the direction of rotation of the disc. Okay, not, not crazy complicated. And this is the way it spins normally, anti-clockwise. Anti all right, next, ensure that the screw does not have any mechanical damage or corrosion, deformation, and or thread damage. All right, replace the damaged screw with a new one. Okay, that's easy. Insert the screw in the brake caliper from the transmission side so that the screw shank is above the spring. So sometimes you have to press that spring down a little bit to get the bolt through. 
not hard, just make sure you do it right. Insert washer and nut on the screw, and I would just put a new nut on there. If you haven't put a new nut on there in a long time, probably just put it on there. Tighten the nut so that the connection does not bind and the screw retains free movement. So snug it down, but you could still move it, like by hand. Like not with your fingers, but you know, make sure there's no forward and aft play, and then you're good. All right, now it says run in the brake linings and the brake disc. No, we're gonna do that in a little bit. We're not gonna do that yet, because we have to check the indication. Perform the functional test of the rotor brake indicating system. Another chapter in the manual we have to go to. Not a big deal. So we go there. Functional test indicating system rotor brake system AMM 6351005-1. Release the rotor brake. The caution rotor brake must not come on. All right. Apply the rotor brake. So pull the rotor brake down, push the main rotor forward direction, and master caution light comes on and rotor brake light comes on. All right, release the main rotor blade, meaning stop pushing on the blades. Make sure that the main rotor blade does not move and release the rotor brake. All right, just release the rotor brake. The master caution goes off and the rotor brake goes off. Once you let go, once you stop pushing the main rotor blade, it should, it should turn off because there's no more pressure on it. There's a little bit more to this check, but that's pretty much it. You just want to make sure your light turns on. You want to make sure that when your rotor brake is grabbing and the rotor spinning, that it turns the light on. So when you go to do the run-in for the rotor brake linings to the brake disc, you could tell that it's grabbing. Because if the light's not working and you're pulling more pressure on the rotor brake, it's gonna just burn it up, okay? And now we did install the brake caliper, however, without performing the ground one. Now we can go all the way back to installing the disc. Now they tell us to install the caliper, which we just did, done. Next. Only applicable if brake disc was replaced, which it was. Replace the brake linings. We just did that. Run in the brake linings and the brake disc. You see, you got to go all over the manual on this one. It's not straight forward. It's not hard. It's not complicated, but you just need to make sure you do this, the right steps at the right time. Now we're in the run in for the brake disc and brake linings for the rotor brake system. Great. It's not really hard at all, but there's a couple cautions that you need to be aware of, okay? They say, they say to remove the left-hand transmission fairing. I'm not sure why. I don't. You could have it all, everything good to go. You get your pilot out there, and you get the ground run. Grind the friction pads and brake disc to one another. Run the engines. You could do one if you want, but anyway, run both engines at ground idle. And your pilot's doing that, and you're going to be the guy pulling the rotor brake. Don't have him do it. Do not pull the rotor brake lever, lever right down to the detent position as this may cause damage to the main rotor drive and rotor brake. Thank you for that. Okay, so with it running, it's in ground. It's not at flight. So we're at low RPM. Unlock the rotor brake lever and while pressing down on the pawl, pull the rotor brake down until the rotor brake caution light is illuminated. Look, the first one or two times you do this, you may not go all the way until the light comes on. You can hear the drivetrain change sound. Like, it sounds like a rumbling sound. So you pull it down a little bit until you could hear it start rumbling. That means it's grabbing, but it's not grabbing enough to turn the light on yet. Next, hold it in this position for five seconds. Now, release the rotor brake and let it cool down for 30 seconds. And then repeat this six times. It says repeat six times. I think that's six plus the initial. I think that's seven times. Some guys do it six, and then later on it says something about six again. So I don't know. Anyway, repeat it six times. Pull the rotor brake. Look, the first time you do it, the first one or two times, the light may not come on. Then the second time, you could give it a little bit more. You could pull a little bit more pressure on the rotor brake, and it will at least start grabbing now, so it will pull it towards the switch, and it will turn the switch on. All right, it's not hard, but you don't want to burn it up. All right, after that, allow the brake disc and friction pads to cool for five minutes and then check function of the rotor brake in ground check run. Some big long German word I can't pronounce. It says 560-00, but that references you to somewhere else. So once it's cooled down after five minutes, you probably have more ground runs that you have to do. So whatever, just get those done. 
and then just make sure at least five minutes has you has gone by to cool down your rotor brake disc and the pucks right all right so you go to the ground run and functional check flight for your aircraft effectivity rotor brake system check of the rotor brake for function at a rotor speed of 50 percent it says optional that doesn't mean it's an optional check that means the rotor brake system is optional okay don't look at this and go oh well, that's optional i'm not going to do it well, that's stupid all right but it's it's a translation problem there okay all right so with engines one and two shut down it says at 50 percent rotor speed unlock it and pull it down your light comes on your rotor brake light comes on like it should and then it says record the rundown time until the rotor stops and then it says parentheses after the rotor brake has been applied six times i don't know why it says that i think they're talking about because you just burned it in and did this six times anyway it should start your it it should stop your rotor in 45 seconds or less it'll probably if you burn it in seven times it'll probably be 25 to 30 seconds or less all right so you're good so you're good and that's it and that's it for replacing the rotor brake disc i'm sorry this one's going to be long all right quick review don't forget what do they call this piece the locking plate which goes underneath the adapter and the connecting parts of the transmission don't forget that all right it's been forgotten in the past another thing you're going to need to shim your caliper to your disc if it's not shimmed correctly then your rotor brake pads are going to wear out um, one side is going to wear out way more than the other or way quicker than the other all right this job's not crazy hard you just got to go all over the maintenance manual it's not straightforward and one other thing that i haven't talked about yet that i think we should just look at real fast which is a whole nother rabbit hole that we could talk about but we're not going to get in depth into this too much the two through bolts that hold the slideway onto the support for the caliper if you see mud around these two bolts here it's probably worn out there's a whole bunch of bushings in there we'll take a look at that in a second but if you see a bunch of mud well every once in a while it's just good to do this anyway just grab your caliper and try to move it up and down like against those bolts not side to side but up and down and you'll see how much wear is in those bolts there's eight bushings in this thing there's four in the slideway and four in the support and those bolts can also wear out those bolts are titanium though so there's eight bushings that will wear out and if it gets really sloppy you're going to need to change those bushings or change the slideway or ch and the support i've never you can order the bushings i just don't know how to change them i've never done that job i think we've just changed the support and the slideway but if you take this thing apart there's two through bolts and there's springs on the left side which help push it away from the switch there's one on each bolt and you could stack up these washers and a certain you could add more washers to a certain point to add more pressure to the spring anyway if you open this and you take all this apart expect springs to go flying and washers to go flying okay so just a heads up and just be careful all right again if you move this um cal if you move the caliper up and down You'll see how much play there is there'll be some play but if there's excessive play you're probably going to need to change those bushings or change that support nothing crazy just keep an eye out for it and then when you snug up the the nut for that through bolt it's pretty much hand tight it's just take up all the space and you should still be able to move it with your fingers all right not hard just something else and if you made it this far in the video you're a champ appreciate it and honestly, I really appreciate you guys watching these videos. If you can, give me a like, maybe subscribe, and send it to some guys who could use this information. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys next time. Later.